Hello, I'm Jen Uphoff Gray, founder and artistic director of Forward Theatre Company. And this is Theatre Forward, a twice monthly conversation about theatre from a local, regional and national perspective. From Madison to Manhattan, we're excited to share insight into our own company while exploring issues surrounding theatre in the Midwest and around the country. Welcome to episode 39 of Theatre Forward. For this episode, I am thrilled to be talking with Courtney Burkett, the producing artistic director of Detroit Public Theatre. We're going to talk about what we've learned launching small professional theaters here in the Midwest and how we've been responding to 2020's challenges, both COVID-19 and the increasing calls for anti-racism in our theaters. So there's a lot to talk about. Welcome, Courtney. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So uh, great to I'm so thrilled to finally be having a chance to talk with you. I have been a fan from afar, although I guess from Wisconsin to Michigan is not so far, <laughs> nope. um, but really watching and admiring what you've been doing since um, creating the Detroit Public Theater. And I thought maybe you could just uh, start this conversation off by telling us about your company, um, you know, how you came to it and, and what your trajectory has been so far. Sure. So we're a very young, uh, small professional theater company in Detroit. This is our sixth season that we're embarking on um, right now. So we're brand new. Um, I have two partners that I founded the company with, Sarah Claire Corporandi and Sarah Winkler. Uh, and we have been producing uh, for five years of, uh, in the Detroit Symphony Orchestra space in Detroit. Um, we founded the company with the feeling that there was uh, a hole in the cultural landscape in Detroit. So there um, were a lot of really great storefront kind of fringe theaters and people doing interesting work in Detroit, of which I had been a part of that community for many years. Uh, but we felt like there wasn't really a, an anchor cultural institution serving the city of Detroit and providing world-class theater. So uh, we sp founded a company with that vision um, in our heads. You know, we said, we had started by uh, coming together as artists and saying, let's do a project. And then we said, well, let's, what if we, what if we went bigger? And, you know, what would we build if we couldn't fail? Um, you know, if we could have anything. And, and we looked around and I, I'm really committed to the city of Detroit and love my city. Um, I'm a fourth generation native Detroiter. And we felt like the, the company that we wanted to work at, but I'm also a very committed theater artist. So, you know, I was working regionally, you know, working in Detroit a lot, but the theater that I really wanted to work at didn't necessarily exist in our region. Um, and there were models obviously all around the country, but we didn't have that in Detroit yet. So we have tried to build that. Um, and, and it's been a really um, exciting place and time to be building and to be creating. And the city has really embraced the work that we're doing. And we've had really, really dynamic artists who have come to the table with us and collaborated. And we've been able to um, build an audience uh, and an enthusiastic audience. And we've really been able to have some uh, work that we're really proud of. And we are looking forward to continuing to build on that long into the future and to be here for a very long time. So we really see this as the infancy of our company, um, but it's been a good five years. It is so wonderful hearing you describe your company and why it was founded, uh, because anyone listening to this who has ever heard me talk about Forward and why we started it will feel like they're having a little bit of deja vu. I mean, really that sense of being a professional theater artist committed to a specific community and looking around and seeing a, a hole that needs filling, um, something that's missing from the cultural tapestry. That's exactly what went into the founding of Forward. So that's I just, I love that. I, I love wonderful. that so much. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're going into our 12th season. So, you know, we're, you know, teenagers by comparison. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about um, some of the projects that you've done in your, in your first five years of producing that you're particularly proud of or that you feel like really exemplify the kinds of work or community connections that you've been building. Yeah, so I think the heart of that, um, the, the there's a couple projects that I want to tell you about, but um, the big thing I think is that in season one, we knew uh, founding a company in Detroit that we really wanted to produce the work of Dominique Riso. Um, and she um, had a relationship with one of my partners, Sarah Winkler. And so very early on, we had a meeting with her. She was in Detroit seeing her family. She spends a lot of time in Detroit and we sat down and talked to her about what we wanted to build. Um, and you know, her work was being produced all over the country, all over the world. Um, she's one of the most pr produced playwrights in America and her plays hadn't been done in Detroit because there hadn't really, no one was producing them in Detroit yet. Um, and so when we talked with her very early, we wanted to open season one with Detroit 67. And 
uh, and she was on board right away and came on, our, I believe she came on in, in an advisory board committee member first um, originally, but then she uh, quickly transitioned to our board of directors as well as um, we were going to produce Detroit 67. And so Dominique understood what we were trying to build, understood you know what we wanted to do and said, I don't want you to open with Detroit 67. I want to make sure we can do it right if we're going to do it. And so she created a partnership with Baltimore Center Stage. So they were producing um, Detroit 67 and we made it a co-production. And Dominique found the support to make that happen. The show, um, we had, you know, we were involved in every, pro in every step of the process. Um, and I went to, to um, Baltimore for their tech and for their previews. Um, and then the show came with the full cast, full design team, um, adjusted all their designs so it would fit in our small black box space. Um, so it was, um, that was really a very nurturing um, investment in the company and in bringing the work and making sure that the, the work um, was being done correctly. Um, when it came to Detroit. So that was really, really important. And then our um, relationship with Dominique has just deepened. Um, and she is uh, a, a really big part of every <laughs> every choice we make. So we've um, produced four of her shows in five years. Uh, we've done a tour of Detroit 67 in addition to that original production that we did with Baltimore Center Stage. Um, and so she is just really um, someone that we have it was a real honor um, to bring the Detroit plays to Detroit and to be able to produce this work that is so specifically um, of our city um, and to have audience members, I'll tell a story because we're on a podcast, I got time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, we had done the, the original production of Detroit 67 and then we were um, creating this this tour. We got funding to take a tour of the production around the city. And we went, I went to a community meeting and the people who, um, there, it was it, for an event that was going to happen on the corner of 12th and Claremont, which is where the rebellion started in Detroit in, in, in 1967. And so the, the people who lived in the neighborhood had been doing an event there for the past 50 years. This was going to be the 50th anniversary summer. And we wanted to come in and bring the play. Um, the Detroit Historical Society invited us to an event they were throwing there to do the play. And there was tension between the Historical Society and the community groups about who was event this was and what was going to happen. So I was in this meeting just like, I don't know, we're going to do a play. We do plays. <laughs> um, so I didn't have a ton of information about the tension between the two groups, um, but I definitely felt it in the meeting. And then after the meeting, one of the um, gentlemen from the other group came over to me and said, I don't like what they're doing. You know, we've been doing an event here for 50 years. We don't need them, but I want you to come because I saw your play and you got it right. He said, you got it right down to the shoes. That guy was wearing the same shoes that I had. <laughs> um, and he, you know, he was of the neighborhood. It was their story. They had lived it and they felt like our production um, was worthwhile and they felt seen um, by the work that we were doing. And, and so we were so honored to bring that play to that spot, to that sacred place, um, on that, in that moment. And then we've gone back since then and done multiple readings in that park also. Um, so that was a community program that really had a lot of impact. Um, and all of that is with Do Dominique's leadership and the connections that she helps us, um, make in the community because she's very connected. I, I love hearing you talk about that. A couple things really come to mind. I mean, the first is just, um, reinforcing something we talk about a lot here, which is the, the value in theater that is created of, by, and for a specific community. Yeah. That, that there is a difference in the kind of art and the kind of connections that can, can result from it. Um, so hearing, uh, hearing that story is really inspiring and, and uh, it feels like that's why we do this. That's why you, you build companies that are, in, you know, really rooted in and invested in a community is to get those kinds of responses. But I also, I love, because we're huge fans of Dominique's work here. We've done Skeleton Crew, our subscribers will know, a couple of years back. Um, but what I love so much about that story, it, you frequently talk about the responsibility of um, theater companies to invest in emerging artists. And what you've just described is a wonderful example of an artist investing in an emerging theater company. That is exactly right. And, right. and how beautiful that is. And it makes me think about all the artists that were willing to work for Forward in our first couple of seasons when we weren't yet at a place where we could pay at the same rates of some of the larger companies in our, in our region. But you know, we have a mission statement of investing in and being an artistic home for Wisconsin-based theater professionals. And a lot of artists that we know said, 
oh, no, no, we're investing in you because then you're going to be here and be here for paid work for us in the long run. And that's certainly what's come to pass. And, and I love how empowering that is for artists too. Like they don't always have to be thinking of themselves or seen or treated like they're at the mercy of an institution. You know, they can also choose as their careers build to invest in institutions that are going to um, invest in them and that it becomes this really virtuous cycle. Uh, so I just, I love hearing that. I love hearing Absolutely. that. And it's, yeah, I love, and I also fantastic. love you know that that now once we have established companies and and people came to the table and helped us build it, now you know you can come and work hopefully at our companies and and not do it as a favor, right? <laughs> but, but because it's it's honest work, you know, yeah. because because there is real work to be had there. There are real audiences. There is real revenue, and and you can pay real contracts exactly um, if, if the support is there. So. Um, that's super exciting. It's uh, in, in nurturing the community of artists. Also, the network is, was really important to us in building DPT. Um, we felt like there were a lot of really talented theater artists who weren't working outside of our market um, in Detroit. And um, having that opportunity with out-of-town directors and out-of-town designers and out-of-town actors coming in for some of the roles creates more opportunities for the local actors because then those directors bring them into other projects. Um, there's one actor who's worked with DPT and he had never worked out of Detroit before. And um, he actually was in that um, Baltimore um, Detroit 67 production. And he um, has now worked at the Globe and he's worked in Cincinnati and he's worked at People's Light and he's worked all over the country now um, because of the different directors he's worked with and, and his work now has is just more familiar. So. Um, the connection to the national community has been really important to us in, in putting um, our artists on the national map and not isolated. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Living the dream. We're living yeah. the dream, right? I uh, you- even if at the moment it doesn't feel like it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I want to tell you also yeah, about ahead. another partnership that's been really important just in our first few years and a, and a project that has been really fruitful for us. And that is um, we decided in our third season, what, no, we decided in our second season. Um, Noah Heidel um, is a playwright who has been produced a lot in New York um, off-Broadway, and he um, was living in Detroit at the time. And so uh, I had known him from in New York uh, a while ago, but he came to the theater and was introduced to us through a board member. And we were like, well, we know who you are, Noah. <laughs> and so he came on board and also joined our board really early. And when we um, asked him if he would write a play that we could produce at Detroit Public Theater. So we committed to producing a show um, before he had ever written a word. And we commissioned him um, to write a play, which turned out to be a play called Birthday Candles. Um, and we premiered that in our third season. First, we did a workshop of it with the Chautauqua Theater Institute. So we workshopped it in the summer at the Chautauqua Theater Company. And then it um, came to Detroit and we closed our third season with it. Uh, and then it was scheduled to open on Broadway. <laughs> uh, in April. It was going to um, open in April on Broadway, but uh, obviously Broadway closed down in March. So it's now scheduled for fall of 2021. Um, the Roundabout Theater Company is producing it on Broadway with Deborah Messing. So we're pretty proud that our first commission <laughs> is, yep. going, is going from Detroit um, to Broadway. And we're you really should proud. be proud. And I've read that script. It's a great play. Yeah, we're really happy about it and really proud of it and think it's going to be something that people will want to produce. And um, and I think also it's going to be really healing. I think it's going to be a very healing play to come out of this with. Um, so I, I know uh, the woman who directed it, Vivian Banesh, um, who um, directed it at Detroit Public Theater, is also directing it at the Roundabout. Um, and I More just, women directors on Broadway. Woohoo! Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and she's incredible. So we're just really proud that the team is, you know, that she's part, that she's part of the team um, with the Roundabout Company and we can't wait, can't wait till it gets there. <laughs> oh, that's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, so tell us um, how uh, the evolution of, of the COVID uh, pandemic impacted your company. You know, when things started to shut down in March, where were you at in your season? What, what kinds of pivoting have you had to do uh, so far? Yeah, so we had just closed a production of Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which was really lucky that we had just closed that because it did really well for us in the box office. So that um, that was great. <laughs> um, but we had just closed that. And then we had our gala on March 5th. 
um, which was great. And luckily, we don't know of any transmission that happened there. <laughs> but, um, but it was really very lucky for us that that happened in March, just for our budget. Um, so that was kind of where we were, we were about to start um, rehearsals on cost of living, which was going to be the last show of our season. Uh, and we had to put the brakes on that, obviously, um, and, and postpone it. And um, we were very sad about losing that production. Um, and we had a season that we were about to announce. So we would have started selling our subscriptions um, at cost of living, which would have been the last show of the season. But that whole season now is uh, up in the air. Um, you know, kind of the growth of the company and where the future is for us. We have been doing some long-term planning um, with our board. We've done some strategic planning and now we're looking forward to, um, you know, what the future looks like for us. And our board is really active and really engaged and we are okay. <laughs> Detroit Public Theater is okay. Um, we miss our audiences. We want to be in dark rooms, breathing the same air as everyone else and telling stories. Uh, but we can't do that now. And there is other work that can be done. And they're um, building. So we're spending a lot of time on preparing to come back stronger and, and working on some the content that we can do while we're gone um, and making sure that when we come back, we are able to serve the Detroit community for a long, long time. Yep. That's, that's where we're all at right now, right? What can we do in the interim and how do we make sure that we're better than ever and, and able to fulfill our missions even more powerfully as we return to live theater. Um, so for right now, your 2021 season is just kind of on hiatus. Is that the... Uh... It is. We have a few projects um, that some are that are um, getting close to being done and some that are um, we're hoping to be able to do in the spring. So we're not doing anything in person, we know, until well into the spring. Um, and those are still very much... Um, Quite a question mark. Uh, we're hoping to have some content that will be released um, in October that we're really excited to share with our audience. So, um, and we think that'll be able to reach people really comfortably and really well. Um, and we're putting a lot of work into making sure we can do that, but also making sure we can do it safely. So we're working with um, the unions and everyone to make sure it's possible to, to create the content and then it'll be distributed in October. We also are working on some um, online work um, with Dominique's plays. Um, we want to do, uh, there's a couple of plays we want to do in the spring, but we just don't know yet. <laughs> We're also looking at um, a commission, another commission. So um, creating some work with a playwright uh, when we come out of here. So we're working on the structure of that um, and then hoping to have, you know, the same success rate we had the first time. <laughs> yeah. Also, we have a Shakespeare in prison program, um, which is obviously not actively in the prisons, but still actively working. So we have a, um, we have a program with people who've been released, a release program, post-release program, and that those um, artists have been doing some really exciting work since then. Um, and we uh, have created some activity packets and have received work back from people who are still in the prison. So trying to stay connected to that community and trying to continue to serve that community has been really important um, because as hard as things are out here, they're even harder in the prisons. Um, so that's been fulfilling to watch what, the, to keep, continue that conversation. Yeah. I'm not sure that everybody who's not in our field understands that for those of us running theater companies, it's a lot more work not producing theater than it is producing theater. <laughs> All it it is. Is. <laughs> it's so, so much time and stress and energy because we can't use the normal toolkit that we have. And so figuring out how to adapt everything, it's just, it, it's a lot of work. So that sounds really um, wonderful uh, what you are able to do and, and I really like the way um, that you're approaching it and you'll do as much as you can when it's safe to do it. Exactly. We're, yeah. in, the, we're in the same boat. So I'm, I, one of the other things I was really, really um, interested in talking with you about is how your company is um, just thinking about and, and responding to or, or, or taking in um, the, the really heightened calls for um, anti-racism and um, dealing with the inherent racism that exists in a predominantly white field like the American theater. You know, we both um, run small professional theater companies that are led by white people. Clearly both of our companies are, are trying to produce very diverse work, but, I'm, but especially because you're in Detroit which is very, very, very different from Madison, Wisconsin demographically. Um, I just, I think that there may be some really fascinating overlap as well as difference in 
what we're doing and how we're responding to the moment in which we find ourselves. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. It is important. It's really been. It's been important to us from our founding. And I, I, I can't believe I've gotten this far into this interview without saying <laughs> that we are. Um, you know, we are a, a company run by three white women in a predominantly black city. Um, and so, you know, Detroit's population is. Uh, we don't look like our population. Um, I am, you know, I am a fourth generation native Detroiter, you know, so um, I do have some claim, <laughs> you know, it is, but it, it's important to us that our work reflects our city and not us. Um, and, and that the team of teams of artists that we're working um, with reflect our city as well as our board and our audience. Um, so that's something that's been in the fabric of the work that we're doing before we, um, from, from our founding. And that has been, um, really prioritized for us the we see white american theater heightens that heightens that call and heightens that charge it's also a huge opportunity for us um it's when you look at the signees the people who've signed the the original statement many of them have worked at detroit public theater many many of the authors of of the the of what's being asked are are artists and so um it's an opportunity for us to lead i think and for us to say what can we do where where are the opportunities where certainly where are the challenges where do we need to improve where do we have to do better um and so we're taking the um document of Bart with our board, with our staff. We're having bi-weekly staff meetings going um, line by line through the documents and, and creating um, committees and figuring out what, what, uh, what items can we address? What items can we report back and say, hey, we're already, you know, we're, our board is, you know, whatever it is, here's where we are. Here's where we see opportunities for growth. Here's where we're failing um, or where we, where we might need more support. So that is um, so exactly what we're doing too, as uh, Scott Hayden, our producer on this call uh, can attest to. Um, yes. Going through that document line by line, because some things uh, really, really apply to our company and, and other things don't. And um, the fact that a hundred percent of it may not be, um, applicable doesn't stop the rest of it from being really important. Um, I, I remember having a conversation with one of my board members really shortly after it came out um, and talking about the fact that because these are issues that have been important to us since our founding, as, as with yours, the existence of this movement is, is such a, a good thing. It really puts, I was saying it puts the wind at our back in a way, the, the focus on this, you know, things that we've been trying and maybe not having as much success as we would like in the past have more likelihood, I think, of, of getting traction now than they maybe did a year ago. And, and But it's also interesting, you know, hearing you talk about um, trying to create work that looks like your community, that, you know, that's where we're in a, in a sort of different but still complicated circumstance here because Madison, Wisconsin is 6.8% black. Mm -hmm. And and we are a company that's founded on trying to do work that is of, by, and for our community. And at the same time, we're actually really aggressively trying to do work that maybe doesn't look like our community. You know, we, we're trying to tell stories where the stories themselves and the people telling them um, are more diverse than the community. Yeah, and offering different perspectives maybe to yeah. You know, I think that's just as valuable sometimes in communities. Sometimes more. We have a very privileged audience overall, yeah. you know, an audience that has, you know, is predominantly white, is predominantly more affluent than perhaps the, the median for our community. And so telling, telling more diverse stories, telling stories from different perspectives to them, I think, I think, yes, can in some ways be as or more important for sparking change. Um, yeah, but it's hard. <laughs> Oh, it's very, very hard. And it's very, uh, there's a lot of accountability and a lot of reckoning um, and um, a lot to, uh, um, a lot of things that we need to fix. There's a lot of problems. The thing that I feel really grateful to the document for, um, first of all, for just saying out loud, a lot of things that haven't ever been said out loud. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really helpful. But also I think it's for, for, as a leader, I, it's a roadmap map. I mean, mm -hmm. it is, held out with with measurable outcomes um and so you can set goals and you can you know and some of the goals that are set might not be might not work for any particular company but you can use the map use the guide to, to yep. decide what your company needs to do so um i think sometimes 
I'm involved with another institution in um, trying to create some change within that institution and having um, those, those measurables are just important. Like you, everybody who comes to the table says, we totally agree with you. We think this is a problem too, but what are we going to do about it? Right. Um, there's always, there's no any heart, very rarely in the American theater. Is there someone who comes and says, I don't see the value of diversity, right. um, but what are, how are you going, how is that going to manifest itself? What are you going to right. do? What are the measurable outcomes? Um, and I think that the, the documents uh, really have helped us to say, here's what needs to happen. So much labor went into them, you know, actual labor, emotional labor into creating that. And yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a map. There are things that as, as white allies, as advocates, as believers in diversity, there's things that we, we know and have known needed to be worked on, but then there's, there's always going to be the blind spots Mm -hmm. that you can't see coming from your own life experience. And there is so much um, there's just so much useful, uh, perspective in that document. And I think as long as, you know, companies like ours are able to look at it and go, we don't have to, to, um, achieve every single thing that's in this document. Um, we don't have to know that we can achieve everything immediately to start work. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for us, it's going through and saying, great, here's something we're already doing. Here's something that we have tried very hard and have gotten nowhere on. Here's something that we've been wanting to work on and hearing that this is a priority really uh, inspires us to put more resources behind it. Um, here's something that never actually would have occurred to us was a, was a problem. And now that our eyes are open, we can immediately address that circumstance. And, and like, yeah, go, just going through point by point and saying, this is something we're already dealing with. Great. This is something we weren't already dealing with, but can immediately start to. And then here's a whole bunch of things that we theoretically could do, but they will take a tremendous amount of resources, be they time, money, or, or what have you. And now let's, let's start to prioritize, you know, what can we immediately start work on? What can we maybe plan to start working on as we come out of the COVID economic challenges and into Um, whatever the post-COVID theater world looks like. And, you know, hopefully that comes sooner rather than later. Um, Yeah, Yeah. same page. Yeah, and in both, in both, um, I think both, both pandemics that this um, nation is facing, facing at this moment, the pandemic of racism and the COVID, I do, I think as leaders, we have a responsibility to say, how, what, how can we come out of this better? What can we learn from this? And what can we do going forward? And how can we do better next time? Um, you know, so, so I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned all over the place. And, you know, a lot of it right now, I think, is, as far as COVID is concerned, it's just listening. I mean, I think in both, actually, <laughs> listening, listening is a really important thing that we can do as leaders right now. Um, so, yeah. You know, we always talk about the importance of uh, when we're creating art, having a safe space in which to do it. Um, I mean, that has been a part of our language. I'm sure yours as well. You know, our, the whole existence of our coming, my whole career. It's about people do their best work when they feel safe. Um, the best art gets created. The best and most truthful stories get told when they feel safe. And the heightened awareness of what that safety means, as we look at, bo- as you said, both of these pandemics mm-hmm. is so crystal clear. You know, every decision that we make about going back to work mm-hmm. when COVID is a part of our reality is about safety. Yeah. And, and, and every decision is about safety. And similarly, um, looking at everything we've been doing and everything we could be doing to make sure that, um, that our spaces feel safe uh, for, for our colleagues who are Black, who are Indigenous, who are other people of color, that, um, that we're doing everything we can. Mm-hmm. And um, we're in a moment where we have all been given a lot of additional information. Mm-hmm. about yeah. what makes for a safe space. And that is yeah. such an opportunity and a gift. And um, then I don't think we could have stopped and listened to in a way, you know, I think especially uh, the, the We See White America Theater document mm-hmm. um, happening in the COVID moment gives us time to really, we're stopped already. We're right. stopped. And we can look at how we're going to put this back together. We, ha- we already stopped. Things have already, you know, been disassembled. Our seasons are not happening in the way that we envisioned them and dreamed them to happen yep. this year. So when we are putting back together the pieces of being able to gather again, 
how do we want to, what do we want to change about the foundation and about the structures um, to make sure that we're making more space for more voices and more artists um, yep. with different perspectives and valuable perspectives. Never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. And it's, and it's exciting. It's, um, it's exciting and empowering. Yep. To, and you know, and, and, and there's a lot of, um, I mean, I just feel like there's so much opportunity and, and th we can do things that we've never done before. Um, and in DPT, I feel like, and forward as well, you know, we've, we've done things that people said couldn't be done before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who can open a small professional regional theater? <laughs> it's yeah. just, yeah, you know, and pay people, um, union wages, but you can, you can do it. You yep. can, uh, you can employ artists, you can create work and, and we can do the, we can do hard things. We can do yes. hard things. <laughs> we can do hard things and we can do it with, we can do it with joy and optimism and commitment. It doesn't have to be um, uh, from a point of shame. It can be from a, a point of view of uh, empowerment. I, I think of one of my uh, favorite local podcasts um, here in Madison, I was listening to recently and, and one of the guests was talking about um, how uh, the joy of living in an unjust world is that you can be involved in making it more just. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I, I love that because I thought, that, you know, that's sometimes how I like to feel about this work. It's exciting to try to make the world better. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be, um, it shouldn't be a downer. It should be exciting and a cause for enthusiasm because that, that's, that kind of energy is what makes the work sustainable long-term. And that's, so we need it. This is a mar the marathon work of a lifetime, not of a moment. Yeah. And, and um, collaborators and partners and, and making yourself useful, um, especially in this moment of COVID when there's so much that we can't do. Like what, what are the things I can do? Where can I be useful? Who can I be useful to? Who needs me right now? Who needs my voice? What power do I have in this world? And what, what can I do with it to, to create change? Yes. Oh my goodness. I feel like we should keep talking for hours. We have so much... <laughs> To say, but this is, you know, this is getting up there on time. I think we can probably um, wind this conversation up. Is there any, any last thing you would like to say or, or add while we're here, Courtney? No, just I've so enjoyed getting to know you and, and spending this time together. I hope, it, I hope we continue this conversation for decades. <laughs> Absolutely. Agreed. Um, maybe a co-pro is in our future. I hope so. Yes. <laughs> It happened here. Um, well, we'll say that that's all for this episode of Theater Forward, a conversation about theater in Wisconsin, the Midwest, and America. Thank you so much for joining us. My, <laughs> yes, and yes. My special thanks to Courtney for her time. Please check out DetroitPublicTheater.org so you can learn more about all of their exciting programming. Check it out and support. Um, our podcast is produced by Scott Hayden, and you can follow us or share your thoughts on Facebook and Twitter at Theater Forward, as always with an ER. If you enjoyed this podcast, please don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform and be sure to leave a review. We are so grateful to have you listening. We will be back soon for another Theater Forward conversation.